Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Guillermo Amaral joins me. We're going to be talking about RC controllers, things that can drive boats and planes and helicopters and all sorts of things, but with open source software. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Guillermo Amaral. Episode 336, recorded May 13th, 2015. Deviation TX. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Braintree. If you're working on a mobile app and searching for the right payments API, check out Braintree V.0 SDK. With one simple integration, you get every way to pay. To learn more and to try out the sandbox, go to braintreepayments.com slash floss. And by DigitalOcean, simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit digitalocean.com, and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code FLOSS in the billing section for a $10 credit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it, projects you might want to download right after the show and go play with it, or maybe projects that just introduce you to whole new realms, like I think this week's show is going to do as well. Uh, but let's go ahead first and bring on our co-host. Welcome back to the show, Guillermo Amaral. Yes, Randall. <laughs> hey, and where are you speaking to us from today? Your secret I'll bunker in Tijuana? <laughs> yes, it's my secret book here in uh, Tijuana, Mexico. You can okay. see my lab behind me. Yes, the scary lab with all the resistors and stuff. Yes, I remember talking about that <laughs> in an earlier show. And uh, for those of you watching the video, you notice that it's indeed it's the big green tree. I'm back at ZipRecruiter, back in Santa Monica, doing the next few shows back from here. And hopefully it won't be so bad with challenges as it was when I was home last week. But uh, hey, we'll just uh, go ahead and continue on with the show. Uh, <clears throat> this week, we have a t couple guys coming on. Mike Meyer and Jeffrey Hauschier. I should have asked him how to pronounce it, but hopefully that's close. He'll, he'll, he'll don't let me know if I get it wrong. They're going to be talking to us about Deviation TX. Deviation TX is replacement firmware for radio controlled uh, I guess like helicopters and airplanes and things like that uh, so, so that the software that's in the thing that you control the these little radio controlled uh, vehicles with uh, apparently could be upgraded and expanded because it's open source so I don't know much about it I haven't played with it I haven't even played with a radio controlled uh, device for it must be about 25 years I think things have probably come quite a ways since then so hopefully they can bring us up to date on that what what do you know about this so far uh, Guillermo? Uh, well I, you know I haven't played with uh, any RC uh, any RC helicopters or planes in like a while I think maybe 10 years uh, but I used to like building them before, so may maybe maybe if this you know convinces me, I can probably look look up my uh, old controller from a box I have upstairs. Yeah, one of the things that this sort of, uh, uh, you know, we had this show, I got it must be like six or seven years ago now, uh, called Open Pilot, where we were talking about the software that goes in the actual RC device. This is sort of, as far as I go, the other end. This is the software that goes in the controller. So you're yeah, yeah. human controlling it, doing it. Yeah, so it looks like, I wonder if they can pair them together. What if there'd be something useful for both of them? I, I don't know. We'll see. Hey, you know, but instead of us just making stuff up, we might as well <laughs> actually talk to the experts. But in just a moment, we actually have a sponsor today. We have people that are helping to pay the bills today. So this episode is in fact brought to you by Braintree, code for easy online payments. If you're building a mobile app and searching for a simple payment solution, check out Braintree. The Braintree V.0 SDK makes it easy to offer multiple uh, mobile payment types. Start accepting PayPal, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, Venmo, cards, and more, all with a single integration. It gives you simple, secure payments, code you can integrate in minutes. And developers, we got you. Don't worry about taking days to integrate your payments with Braintree. It's done in minutes. And if you don't even have time, give them a call, and they'll even handle the integration for you and walk you through it. Wow, that sounds cool. The Braintree code supports Android, iOS, and JavaScript clients. There's SDKs in seven languages, .NET, Node.js, Java, Perl, yay, Perl, uh, PHP, Python, and Ruby. <laughs> Elegant code with clear documentation, 10 lines of in-app code. So Braintree gives you an easy way to accept multiple payment types with one integration. Quick, knowledgeable developer support if you have any questions. Start accepting Apple Pay, PayPal, Bitcoin, Venmo, cards, and whatever's next, all with a single integration. With the Braintree V.0 
V.0 SDK, excuse me there, one small snippet of code and you're all set up in less than 10 minutes. To learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash floss, F-L-O-S-S. We appreciate their support for this show and other shows on the Twit Network. So let's go ahead and bring on our guest. Let's bring first on um, uh, Mike Meyer. Mike, welcome to the show. Hello. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and where are you speaking to us from? Uh, central Oklahoma. Oh, cool, cool. Somewhere the uh, I have to say flyover states. I'm sorry, it's probably embarrassing <laughs> to say it that way, but I think I don't think I've ever been in Oklahoma. I think I've been over it a lot number of times though. So uh, uh, good, good. And uh, and uh, um, let's go also ahead and bring on uh, Jeffrey Hausher. Am I close, Jeffrey? <laughs> Pretty close. Uh, it's Hausher. Hausher. Oh, that might have made it a little simpler. Okay, good. And where are you speaking to us from? Portland, Oregon. Oh yeah, my home. So I was just there like Saturday. So we just, I just uh, went off. We could have done this show next to each other. I guess pretty cool. I'm actually out in Beaverton area. What, what part are you in? Um, I live in kind of way northwest. Okay, cool, cool. All right. Well, this show is not this week in geography. It's about Deviation TX today. So let's start with you, Mike. Uh, can you give us sort of an overview of the project and uh, correct me if I made any mistakes in the opening of the show? Um. I think you got it mostly right. Uh, Jeffrey would actually be a better person to do this. He originated the pro project. I just got him here. Um, <laughs> but it is re replacement firmware for the Walkira Devo line of transmitters. The next release should also run on the FR Sky Tyrannus. Um, that gives you access to the in basically the insides of what's going on in the mixer, letting you do things that... Um, most proprietary firmware just will not let you do because it's designed to make it easy to set up your helicopter or aircraft or whatever, assuming they know which one you have. <laughs> and, and so what would be something that would be difficult to do with the standard software and uh, Deviation TX makes easier? <sighs> hmm. Well, actually, I was dealing with the uh, sailboat behind me and mm -hmm. wanted to set up so I had one control, the throttle, to control two different um, lines, the two sails, and have separate trims for them. Mm. Right? And that was very easy in Deviation TX, and I have no idea how you would do it on any proprietary firmware. Um, if you go poking around for it, you can find people who say, well, you open up your transmitter and you put in a piece of slab to restrict the throttle movement and um, then you're set. Okay. Um, that sounds really interesting. And, and let's go ahead and, and bring and go back to Jeffrey there. So so where, what's, where, how did this project get started and, 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 and why did you get involved? Well, I guess uh, about three years ago. Um, I hadn't been in RC for probably as long as you. It's probably been since I was a kid, you know, 25 years ago. Um, last time I actually used an RC vehicle, I really wanted, I'd seen that the mini, heli, uh, mini helicopters had been, you know, coming back online and we'd flown big helicopters back in the day, but, you know, with the, well, the gas powered helicopters we used to have, you know, just learning to fly them could cost you thousands of dollars because every time you did anything, they'd break and then you have to go spend a lot of money to fix them. And as a, you know, high school kid or younger, didn't really have the ability to deal with that. So, um, Anyway, I'd no, I noticed that these new, you know, little micros had come online, and I started looking into them. Um, I picked up a really cheap toy, I mean, we're talking 50 bucks, um, and found that the, the transmitters that came with them were just junk. Um, at the same time, I realized that, you know, I found um, another open source uh, transmitter that was out there, the, um, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of it, but um, <laughs> it runs on the, uh, the old FlySky line. Um, and that it would just work with this new little toy helicopter and it made it a whole lot easier to control. Um, and since I'm an electronics guy, I thought it would be uh, fun to, to look into that. And I found quite quickly that the hardware that they were running on was very limited. It didn't really have the ability to do a whole lot of anything other than what they were doing with it. Um, and so uh, we looked around and we found a uh, we found some hardware that's all ARM based. Um, it wasn't it wasn't open source. It's all proprietary. That's the Walkera Devo line, but you know it, it can be upgraded. It can be programmed through the USB port, and so we went about you know writing our own firmware for it. 
How difficult was it to figure out what to do to make it programmable? Uh, is that, did that involve something like equivalent to uh, jailbreaking an Android or iOS phone? Um, more or less. It was so. The, these ARM these uh, ARM Cortex cores have a uh, a standard way of uploading to them. So in theory, it could have been very easy. You just use stock software and you upgrade it. It turns out that the Walkera line specifically had. Um, some really crude encryption to make it a little bit more difficult. So we had to upload, you know, um, you know, small snippets and try to get things working. Eventually, we figured out what they were doing. As I said, it's a really, uh, really crude type of encryption just to make this firmware a little bit harder to read. And once we had that, then we could just program it as usual, and it was mostly a question of figuring out the hardware. Wow. Uh, so that was that, <clears throat> that. Did you did you do the equivalent of bricking any of your devices while you're trying to do that? Um. I didn't break any of mine. The uh, the firmware is actually the way the firmware works is actually quite robust. The uh, the bootloader lives in the beginning in the front end of the uh, of the ROM, and it protects itself from being overwritten. Although it's possible, it's not easy to do. Certainly not from the bootloader. So we could keep just re-uploading the bootloader until it worked. It was or you know re-uploading re the new firmware through the bootloader until it worked. So it wasn't too bad. Now I know people who have bricked them since then. But um, yeah, I, I never had that problem. And and even still, with uh, a little programmer, you can unbrick them. I mean, the STM32, the uh, ARM Cortex it uses, is uh, you can always just reflash a new image onto it. So you'll never permanently damage it if you have the right hardware to, to get it around that. So how hard was it to actually uh, start flashing your own firmware on it when you were uh, starting out with this project? Did, did you uh, find any JTAG port on it, or how did that work? It does yeah, it has an SWD port, which is basically the same as a JTAG. Uh, so we were able to, you know, that, and I uh, initially, however, the firmware is, uh, the firmware that comes on the device is, um, you know, the, the device is protected. So the only way you can, um, you can use the, J, the JTAG port is to reflash a new flip firmware, which also requires you to reflash the bootloader, which then you lose the, uh, then you have to put your own bootloader on there, which it's possible, but um, I didn't get, I didn't start doing working with the JTAG port until after I had um, figured out how to talk to the device so that I could download the bootloader and have a copy of it. Uh, that just made it easier uh, you know, so that I could then uh, basically open the device and reflash the, the bootloader back onto it. Um, that made it a lot easier. Uh, could, could you could you give us a little idea of how, it, how much time it took you to reverse engineer that uh, encryption on, on the uh, device there? day or two. It was not much work. So it's, uh, uh, they, they were just uh, maybe XORing something or, you know, was it a standard? I'm guessing they didn't use any uh, private key encryption or anything, you know, that complicated no, then. Um, they basically just have a, a shift. Uh, they just, they, there's our byte range and in that byte range, they, they shifted a certain number of bytes depending on the transmitter. So each transmitter has its own shift value. Um, but it's, again, it's pretty crude. I mean, it was, um, and the nice thing about their solution was, uh, at least for us, most of the bytes you upload just go directly in unaltered. It's only a range of bytes that get changed. And so we were actually, as we were going through this, we were able to find bytes that we could send unaltered. And so we could actually write little mini programs into the firmware um, that would work, and then we'd write a bigger one and it wouldn't work. And so eventually we were able to figure out um, you know, what was going on there. We could write data into the firmware and then read it back and see how it changed, and we could figure out what what it was it was doing. See, yeah, that's the sort of stuff I like. <laughs> so it's it's all super fun. Uh, do you guys handle it? Uh, is it? I'm guessing it's only uh, Cortex M. You guys are are working with. Yeah, they're um, all of the uh, all of the Walkera transmitters are all um, the STM, the ST Micro uh, Cortex M3 based. Um, the uh, the Tyrannus is also M3 based. It's got a F, uh, the F2 processor in it, but um, they're, they're, it's all the ones we've worked on so far have all been basically yeah Cortex M3. Well, that's over. That sounds extremely fun, uh, especially working with those processors. I, I get to work with them a, a few uh, with a few of them uh, uh, sometimes. So it's it's kind of I, I'm probably getting a little bit too geeky for our uh, Linux uh, audience here. So uh, what can you tell us about about um, uh, about how uh, you guys figured out um, to upload the uh, new firmware. I, I, is there a, a certain uh, way you have to boot the device uh, in, in, to be able to uh, push new firmware into it? 
So the transmitters are designed to be software upgradable. So there's basically a button on the transmitter you press while you're turning it on, and it will switch into bootload mode. And then you just use a standard. The Walker comes with it actually delivers its own um, USB, you know, Windows program. You just kind of dump the firmware in it and hit the button. Um, I have since written my own uh, Java-based uh, USB programmer for this uh, so that we could do it on basically any platform um, because being restricted to Windows kind of sucks. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to I, <laughs> I was gonna work into that. Uh, okay, so it's uh, you're mainly uh, using USB then to, uh, to be able to uh, push it with your new custom hardware there? I mean, your uh, custom software? Uh, yes. Did you use, by any chance, did you use Perl? <laughs> I, I'm a big Perl programmer uh, myself. Uh, you know, I use Perl a lot at work. And so um, I have some utilities that run kind of to manipulate the firmware before I upload it that are all written in Perl. But most Yay. of the code itself is all C. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so did you uh, start with uh, the whole uh, software from scratch or did you maybe uh, uh, fork this from a different project? Um, no, the, the deviation software was all written basically from scratch. We looked at some of the open source uh, transmitters, as I mentioned, um, that ran on the old FlySky, but um, they were really, they, they weren't suitable for the kind of things that I wanted to do. Um, the, we did uh, re-implement many of the same concepts that they use. So they have kind of methods of working and um, you know ways of interacting with the transmitter, and we I copied a lot of that from the ER9X, the, uh, some of these other firmwares that, uh, that are out there for different hardware. But the, the actual software is all written from scratch. Uh, I, you know, I should probably get into this. Uh, what type of license are you guys working with? And, and if, uh, is this code available somewhere we can get it? Or is it just, you know, uh, uh, maybe on GitHub? So everything's on GPL. We, uh, the entire project is GPL licensed. Um, and you can absolutely find it, actually, if you go to deviationtx.com, you'll find a link to, um, I think you should find a link to the Bitbucket. We, we run it in uh, Mercurial, not in Git. So um, Bitbucket, you can find the, um, you can find everything there. So uh, were, you able, were you guys able to uh, maybe uh, reverse engineer the original firmware? Or how, how did you uh, go uh, into actually figuring, figuring out the, the hardware part to make your own uh, firmware for it? For, um, so there's two kind of pieces to that. Uh, for the physical hardware inside of the transmitter, it was a lot of just um, <laughs> actually taking pictures of the boards, tracing them out, um, figuring out. I mean, most of the interfaces are standard, so it's almost all SPI. There's a couple of wide buses for the display driver. Um, you know, uh, so we you could pretty easily just look at it and see. It, you know, figure out what you need to attach to, and then attach a logic probe. And snoop the snoop the buses while the transmitters, um, you know, while the, tra the official tra firmware is on there. All the the dials, the buttons and dials and uh, switches and levers, um, you can just trace them back. You figure out which ones are analog, which ones are digital. It's it's pretty straightforward from there. Um, that took a lot longer certainly to get our firmware working. I think we were maybe a month or two before we had all of the hardware basically understood in the first transmitter. Oh, that's great. Uh, so I'm guessing it doesn't use any external uh, ROMs or anything complicated like that. It's just basically using the internal uh, uh, the internal interfaces. Yep, there's a uh, there's a small uh, flash serial flash on the on the device, which is used for extra storage for model, basically saving your models off and some configuration parameters. Um, and that again was pretty easy to get to. We actually got to that almost first because before we figured out the serial port. Um, it was kind of the only way to get information off of the device. That sounds super interesting. Uh, so what's going to be next on your agenda? Is there uh, any newer models you're, you are planning on on maybe working with? So Walkera has a line of three, five, I don't know, seven or eight different transmitters um, that they have sold over the past five years or so. Um, we support almost all of them. Um, there are um, there are some brand new ones. They've basically changed their work model. Now that drones have become really popular, they're basically going into the drone, mo drone market and they've basically stopped selling their older transmitters. They certainly don't support them anymore. Um, so uh, right now we're trying to, to get their latest version, which has uh, FPV, that's uh, video feedback from the model back in. 
Um, and we're trying to get that up and running right now. Let's uh, let's give uh, Jeffrey a, just a little break here. Uh, Mike, uh, what's your relationship to the project? Um, I started using it a couple of years ago, pretty much the same way that Jeffrey did. I started with uh, small helicopters using the uh, OpenTX firmware that I believe he was trying to remember the name of. Okay. And went looking for, wanted a better quality transmitter than what that ran on at the time, and found the Walkera Devos in Deviation TX. And And, um, I contribute patches and upgrades to the firmware, and like I said, I uh, set up this this for us, try to get us a little bit more exposure. And oh yeah, I uh, actually uh, a few months ago we things were slowing down. Um, Jeffrey was busy, and I was getting frustrated trying to integrate patches coming in from. A number of other people so I set up a uh, team repository that pretty much everybody who was working on it shifted to and Jeffrey was kind enough to start doing nightly builds from and link to when he got when he got back to work on the project some more cool cool uh, and and Jeffrey um, I, I understood you've done some really other interesting things as well I mean you look like you're just one of those uh, Renaissance maker guys can you tell me some of the other things you've worked on um. I've, I've loved working on hardware since forever, as far as electronics go. Um, let's see, recently, um, when it, well, when I moved into my house about 10 years ago, we found we're out in the country um, and uh, you know we're on a well pump um, and the pump was really finicky. Um, we had a very low flow well at the time, you know, um, and so trying to keep the, uh, the tank full without draining the well dry, uh, right, it was set up in a really crude manner. Um, so I, the first thing I did when almost as soon as I bought it, the house was to kind of build a little um, controller that would, uh, you know, basically monitor the the water level. Um, I, it uses a capacitance level uh, meter to, in, inside of the plastic inside of the water tank to measure how high the uh, the water level is, and it turns the it cycles the pump kind of on a, um, intermittent frequency to make sure that the tank stays full without draining the well dry. Um, since then, I haven't needed it anymore. We changed our our setup, but. That was one of the first things I did when I got here. Um, more recently, you know, being from the Northwest or you know, living in the Northwest now, I've been big into um, homebrew, uh, and so I've got a big, uh, a big uh, uh, kegerator downstairs, and uh, I was trying to set up something that would basically measure the level inside of each of the kegs, which turns out to be quite challenging because they're uh, metal pressure vessels. So there's not a lot of mechanisms that you can use to uh, to get at that. So I've tried different systems. I've tried the same system I used in my uh, well pump, a capacitive measurement. I've tried weight systems. Um, we've tried flow control. Honestly, I've still not found anything that really works well, but uh, <laughs> it's been an ongoing project. Hey, so uh, so uh, getting back to the, the RC stuff, because that's really what we're here for today. Um, the RC controllers that I used many, many decades ago that were, were basically just dumb boxes. I mean, it basically some signal was transmitted as an analog channel and you could have like four channel controllers, things like that. What What is the purpose of putting so much smarts in the transmitter now? Are they doing fancier things with it, obviously? Um, yes, a lot of the, the, the main reason I think is again, um, the helicopter type of uh, controls. Uh, one of the things that you want with uh, especially with helicopters, is um, the ability to have variable rates. So you basically don't want a one-to-one -one match between the uh, stick position and what, the, uh, what the, the stick is, what's actually going on on the helicopter. Um, and in, with helicopters, you actually have to mix in your throttle with the blade pitch. So there's, um, there's a need to basically you know, merge multiple channels together to, um, to basically control the, the, the helicopter properly. Now, a lot of that recently has been moved onto the helicopters, and so we're starting to get more into sort of dumber, dumber transmitters being success, uh, acceptable. But for uh, high performance flight, you really need these more uh, the kind of digital uh, mixers that will uh, you know, control the, uh, give you more control over what's going on here. Uh, so that's a lot of it. To be honest, on my side, um, most of what we really get is the ability to do custom protocols so that we can control lots of different models with one transmitter because the, the primary thing that these transmitters have, all being proprietary, is they only talk to their own thing. So 
you know, they try to lock you into a specific type of um, you know model or receiver, and you know that's really where we get a huge a huge bang from our software is the ability to, to talk to almost anything out there. So you've kind of created the universal remote for RC. That's the goal. Um, it's been quite challenging. Um, we have. Uh, it turns out that you know most helicopters these days are running on 2.4 gigahertz, um, and there's five or four or five different transceiver chips that are used across all these lines, and they don't talk to each other. So trying mm. to figure out solutions that allow us to control all these different things has been quite challenging. Well, uh, so if they're using different chips, doesn't that mean it's entirely different radio frequencies or it's just different ways of using the same radio frequency and it's more of a software issue? Um, well, the chips are not compatible. So right now what we're doing is we're actually, um, we one of the things that we support is basically modifying the internals of your transmitter. As I said, the uh, everything works on an SPI bus. So you can basically buy these little mod modules from China for the different chips and wire them all in and then talk to them differently. Um, and so you've got the, the hardware stack, the transceiver, and you have the software stack, the protocol that sits on top of it. Um, and so with basically four different chips inside of this transmitter that have been hacked in you know, aftermarket, uh, you can control almost anything out there now. It sounds like you might even uh, eventually move to something like software defined radio, or is that just not general enough for what you need? Uh, generally, we'd love to. Um, so far, we haven't found anything that's fast enough to be able to keep up and that's cheap enough for it to be worthwhile. Um, one of the side projects I've been working on has basically been a, a custom um, board that actually has four different transceivers, the four different transceiver chips on it with a MUX in front of it that, and uh, all in RF so that you can just plug one board in, basically plug and play. We take out the one that comes with the radio, put this one in, and you're ready to go. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we're very close. Is there a linkage for this to say, talk to say a laptop and be able to do pro, uh, complex program maneuvers? So um, we do have support for um, USB, uh, basically feeding USB signals into the, tra the transmitter and using USB to drive the transmitter. Um, you know, that works already. As far as the standalone module I've been built, I've been building that will also have a USB mode and theoretically you can just plug it into a computer and use it with no transmitter, just using the software. And uh, I don't know if I, you got the answer to this earlier, but uh, what license is this under and why did you choose it? Um, as I said, everything's under GPL. Um, I'm, oh. a, I'm a big fan. Um, so, uh, yeah, mostly I like having other people, you know, contribute to projects and keep things open so I can see what they did. Um, I find the, the GPL is a good license for that. And uh, how many other people actually are contributing to the code basis? Obviously more than just you. Um, it depends. We've had, over the years, we've had a lot of different people come and go. I, RC is one of those things that people seem to get into and then out of. So um, we've had several, maybe four or five major contributors who have kind of um, done large portions of the code base over the years. And right now we probably have five or six people who work on um, smaller ways, either helping, most of them are helping with the protocol work. So, you know, all these toy helicopters and toys that are out there, people are figuring out how they work and writing the code to make them work in our, our transmitter. Well, that's very, very cool. Well, we're about, uh, Guillermo wants to ask a few questions, but before we do that, we have another important message to, for this particular show. We want to talk about DigitalOcean. Whether you're an experienced code warrior or just getting started, you need flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting. DigitalOcean provides developers with droplets, which are virtual private servers that can be customized and deployed quickly to host websites, web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, and almost anything else you can think of with full root access. I'm actually a DigitalOcean subscriber myself. I found out about it at the last this year's scale. Uh, I started a little box up, and just like they say in a moment here in the copy, it's you can. I started my box in 55 seconds from the time I entered all the information. It was up and running. Nice little box, five bucks a month, 20 gigs of SSD disk, really cool. DigitalOcean is built for developers and used by over 400,000 of them, including me, as I just said. Deploy and configure your droplets with a streamlined control panel or a simple API. Choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, and FreeBSD. I'm a FreeBSD user, so that made me really uh, uh, appeal to this. One-click install allows you to quickly deploy apps like Django, Docker, Drupal, LAMP, GitLab, MediaWiki, Node.js, WordPress, Ghost, Magenta, Magenta 
Magento, OwnCloud, Ruby on Rails, and more. All servers are built on hex core machines with dedicated ECC RAM and RAID SSD storage. Very fast machine, very, very fast. Servers can have up to 20 CPUs, 64 gigs of RAM, and 640 gigs of SSD hard drive space. Highly scalable to meet the demands of a rapidly growing application or business. Auto backups and snapshots let you easily get done you get easily clone, deploy, and resize droplets as you grow. You can deploy servers in regions all over the world with gigabit speeds and 99.99% uptime. Full feature DNS management to easily manage your domains or use dedicated IPs. Web console access with HTML5 plus SSH, SFTP, and KVM or VNC for virtual desktops. Extremely active community with a large and detailed set of tutorials on all the ways you can use your droplet. Want to deploy Docker? Set up a personal VPN? They've got you covered. And it's so easy to get started. You can deploy an SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. I, I'm attesting to that. Definitely works. So DigitalOcean has incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing. Servers start at only $5 a month. There's also hourly pricing available starting at less than a penny per hour. But we're going to make it so you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code FLOSS for a free $10 credit. That's two months at $5 a month. That's Plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do. That's digitalocean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code FLOSS in the billing section for a $10 credit. We thank DigitalOcean for their support of this show. And now, Guillermo, you have some questions? Yeah, you know, uh, I was wondering uh, if I wanted to start uh, contributing to this project, uh, would I need the hardware, you know, to start? Uh, could I just uh, maybe submit a few patches, work on this maybe in a simulator? So... We do have a simulator. Um, it runs on, I think it'll run on almost any platform now. It uh, certainly, it's a FLTK based. So um, we build it for Windows and Linux pretty regularly. Um, it's actually part of my nightly build for at least Windows. Um, it builds fine on Linux. I think people have built it on, on Mac. I'm not a big Mac guy, but um, anyway, so you can do a lot of the development on the simulator. I do almost all of the development on the simulator. Um, the hardware itself, I mean, adding a new uh, hardware device or you know, the protocol work, that stuff all has to be done with actual hardware. But um, as far as, you know, the interface and, you know, getting new features in, yeah, that stuff, we do it all. I, at least I do it all with the simulator. So quite, not, quite possible to do. Yep. So it shouldn't be too uh, expensive to get into the project. I'm, I'm guessing they can do away without the uh, hardware for now and just maybe start working on the project, uh, you know, on their off time. Sure. If, uh, we're certainly welcome to have people who are interested. Um, generally speaking, I think that most of the people who are going to be interested in our project are going to want to be actually flying. Um, although, uh, so I would expect that they would rather quickly want to move into running hardware. Um, but yeah, sure, you know, we'd, we'd be happy to have any help we can get. Does somebody need a embedded experience uh, to, to be able to contribute? Um, no, the, the code itself is all written in C. We have... We have our own custom GUI, so you know, getting up to speed can take a little bit of uh, of work to kind of understand the ropes. But um, the again, the, the the simulator itself is completely isolated. There's a very a very clear API layer that I've put in place to separate the hardware from the software. Um, so if you're not actually trying to manipulate the hardware type of stuff, then you've got to you know just you know use your GCC and get going. So uh, how how complicated how complicated would it, would it be to get the to the uh, tool chain working for this? Um, on Windows or on Windows or Linux, it's really easy. I mean, Linux there's no tool chain. You just uh, get FLTK installed and you're ready to go. On Windows, basically we have some instructions using uh, MingW um, and uh, to basically uh, build the FLTK um, and the sound drivers. And then again, you uh, you know DCC and you're ready to go. So uh, just a short question, there, there's no Mac support, I'm guessing? I'm sorry, can you say that again? There, there's no Mac, Mac, Macintosh support? There is Macintosh support. Everything, um, again, they, uh, I don't build it myself, but people do build on Macintosh just fine. Um, you know, you do, I think you do need GCC, so I think you need to put your own compiler in there. But um, yeah, it's been built on Mac. We have instructions. Um, I didn't write them because I don't have access to a Mac. But, uh, yeah, it works fine on Mac too. Um, and for the actual hardware, you need to uh, you need an embedded uh, boot, a boot, uh, embedded stack to um, program the embedded devices for the actual transmitter. So for that, you need to go download the uh, the, the embedded GCC 
um, from Launchpad. So, uh, what may, maybe our, I'm sure our, our audience is probably interested in, in knowing what 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 does it make it uh, what would make it uh, make it <laughs> what would make it better? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, what what would make it better for you to choose uh, this open firmware? Uh, you know, compared to the the uh, I'm guessing the uh, propri proprietary firmware that came with the device. Uh, I, I I know you guys mentioned that it makes it uh, maybe easier to customize, but is there any other uh, features that we can uh, talk about? So there's there's several things that you can do. Um, certainly, you can buy. We can get a lot more from the low end devices. So you can buy the cheapest device they have, which is I think a Devo 7E, um, and you can get full 12 channels out of it. It only starts with seven. Um, you can add, again, if you want to, you can take this really cheap device and you can add extra switches to it and get a lot more functionality. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, the ability to basically control any 2.4 gigahertz model out there with one transmitter means that for people who have a bunch of radios or a, a bunch of, uh, of uh, vehicles, they go out there with all their vehicles and just one transmitter and they can, they can control them all. So um, those are the big things, um, I think, from my perspective. Uh, certainly, we give you a lot more flexibility to do complex things, but most people don't want to do complex things. I mean, the majority of people want to do a lot of simple things. And uh, in security wise, and uh, how could, I'm not sure, uh, if you flash this uh, on your controller, would, would it, would you guys be legally, you know, legally responsible if something wrong were to happen? Let's say if the, uh, Controller, you know, shuts down and the uh, airplane you're flying maybe crashes against uh, to a house or a car. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we obviously tell everybody, and there's a huge warning on our on our page that um, you know, in the end, it's your responsibility to control this. Um, you know, the firmware will crash every once in a while. we we work really hard to make that not the case, but you know, it is absolutely in development. Um, if you're flying a big expensive, uh, a powerful helicopter, you need to make sure that you're flying it safely, which means keeping it away from people. Um, if you're flying smaller things, then they're not going to hurt as much. But, you know, we've had a lot of people crash. We've broken a lot of things and nobody's ever um, tried to, to complain that, you know, it was our fault. I mean, obviously the software is there and it might not work, but um, you really have to take responsibility for your own actions when you're using this. Um, and so this is really one of those cases where you know, uh, we're just providing you a service. If you decide to, to use that, um, then, you know, you should take responsibility for it. So I'm sort of curious, you keep talking about customizing this. Uh, what's the interface for that? Do I have to change the C code to say, set that, you know, that double trim that, uh, that Mike was talking about? Or is there some sort of scripting language built into this so I can just uh, edit a, a text file to make it have different combinations? Like that? Uh, yeah, how, where's my customization coming from? So um, the different radios all have different interfaces to some extent. They um, All of Walkera's uh, radios have um, basically six buttons that control it on the radio um, for kind of working through. They all have um, the video screens on them of some sort. So they either it's a black and white low resolution or a color touch high resolution screen. They all have some sort of interface that's giving you feedback. So we have a series of menus that you can work through to basically configure anything you need to you know, inside the transmitter while you're sitting there. The, our software also writes out an INI file onto a flash disk, onto the flash memory, and you can access that as a USB drive. So if you take your transmitter, you can plug it into your PC um, and turn it on, and it will recognize as a SD drive or a flash drive, and you can copy files on and off, and you can work on all these files and text, um, which people do. It's a good way to share files. We have a huge library on our website of all the different of different models that people have customized and set up properly. So you can go on there, find one that fits your needs, copy it to your transmitter, and you're ready to go with no kind of having to put with it. So is this a text file, or is it a programming language, or something in between? It's, it's just a text file. It's not. It's I and I. I mean, it's you know pretty bog standard key value pairs um, as far as what the, the text file itself is. Okay, and so somewhere in there, I'd be able to say that this particular slider uh, controls both of these outputs by a factor of uh, two to one on one and one to one on the other. Is, it, is there a language for that? Um, so we do obviously have our own you know, keys as far as what they are and what they mean. And 
Um, we don't have very good documentation on that side. As I said, the most common way to do it is either with the simulator or with uh, on the actual hardware to create an INI, the, to create this file through the menu system and then just write it out and you can look at it. Really, just really advanced people or debuggers will go through and actually look inside the INI to understand what it has in it. But basically, yeah, there's a kind of a mini language that defines you know all the keys and how what the right val legal values for them are. And uh, so where, is, is there anything that the standard software for these does that you haven't quite caught up with yet? Or is this completely eliminated any need I'd ever want to go back to the original software? Um, there are a few things that we don't do. Um, one of them is that the, uh, the original firmware allows you to wirely, wirelessly transmit models between radios. So you can send somebody your... Uh, you know your your model to and um, if they have the same transmitter, um, they could use that. Now we've gone a different direction. We've decided that we want um, all of the transmitters we support to be interchangeable, so that you can take one model from you can take the model file from one transmitter and put it on a totally different model transmitter, and it will work. Yeah. Well, Kara does do that. They only allow you to transmit between equivalent transmitters, the same model. Um, but it's something that we don't have support for, as an example. Okay, uh, and where is this heading? What's the, what's the biggest thing that you're still missing as of today? Well, as I said, there's a couple of transmitters that we really want to be able to support um, that we don't yet. And I think the really the next big thing will be this um, trying to, to the hardware side, try to get this universal module that you can plug in, so that you don't have to do a bunch of soldering to get all your uh, you know to get the full the full support for all of the protocols. Okay, and uh, I was actually pawing through the manual, not that I understand half of it, but I noticed there were some GPS displays. Does that mean these big uh, new machines have their own uh, onboard GPS? Lots of, yeah, lots of, um, of uh, models now have GPS. Uh, as I said, drones are getting pretty big these days, and drones tend to have GPS coordinates built, uh, GPS uh, receivers built into them. Um, and that information all can get transmitted back to the transmitter. Um, also, you can put on add-on GPS onto many different uh, models, depending on what you want. So um, I haven't used the GPS myself much, as I said. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but I don't actually fly all that often. So, um, <laughs> in fact, I'm, a, I'm just a terrible pilot. I'm much more interested in the hardware and the software side than I am in actually playing with these things, as it turns out. But um, as far as support goes, yeah, we have all that. And uh, does that mean you can have, like, a panic button that says, bring it back to me? In theory, um, we haven't gotten that. I mean, I don't have uh, scripts that are quite sophisticated enough to do that kind of flying. Um, that's more of an automation, and the transmitter software that we're writing is really built in, built for uh, you know drone flying for that kind of automation. Okay, if great. You, uh, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, if if your drone supports that kind of panic button, deviation will work with it. I have one that does that, and it works just fine. Throw the panic button, and I will, and put the transmitter down. And watch it land um, wherever to call from. Awesome, awesome. awesome. That sounds really cool. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, no, yeah, just a yeah, just a little thought. Are you guys thinking of maybe making this some sort of uh, Internet of Things uh, device? When, when will I be able to control the controller with my cell phone? <sighs> <laughs> It's interesting that you asked that. We, uh, it's another project that I've been working on, um, sort of on the side of being able to interface um, with a Bluetooth module, the, uh, the transmitter and the, uh, you know, with your phone so that you can run, effectively you can run um, a better interface on your, on your phone um, um, to the transmitter. Now in theory, um, that could be extended all the way to full control so you could just fly it around with your, uh, with your phone that's not the direction I'm personally going in right now, but um, it's certainly possible. We're just about out of time, so I want to get each of you have a chance to give uh, tell us about anything that we didn't actually cover in the show. So we'll start with you, Mike. Is there anything that we didn't ask that you really wanted to make sure our audience was aware of? No, I think you, I think you got to all of it. Very good. And, and same question for you, Jeff. I'd like to talk about. Sorry, yeah, uh, Jeffrey. Same question. Um, no, I think we covered pretty much uh, the gambit of what, what we're up to here. Cool. And uh, I have to ask a couple of common questions or else my audience will yell at me. That's really, really, they do. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, first, I think I know the answer to one of these questions, but what's your favorite scripting language? <laughs> I, uh, I certainly do most of my programming in Perl, so that's probably where I'd go. 
Yay, yay. Mm-hmm. One of the first mm-hmm. guys that answered, most of it's Python these days. Ugh. The other P language. Anyway, and, and what's your favorite yeah. text? Yeah, what's your favorite text editor? Um, I'm a VI man. Oh, well, one out of two isn't bad. One out of two isn't bad. All right, didn't say the magical Emacs word. And uh, Mike, same questions for you? Um, my favorite scripting language would be Haskell these days. Ugh. And, okay. <laughs> and, my, and, and my preferred text editor is Emacs running on FreeBSD. Yay, Emacs and FreeBSD. That's two correct answers. That counts up for all the other ones. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I, I would guys, probably say that's half. No, it's not half. That's two. Come on. That's two, that's two points. I got two points on that last answer. I, I, I run the scoreboard. It's my scoreboard. It's my show. Well, guys, thanks for coming on today and talking about Deviation TX. It was, it's actually, uh, I don't do this stuff, but it, it was. I thank you also, Guillermo, for asking really, really good questions. I got really fascinated as we were going through this. So thanks, guys, for coming on. Hopefully, it'll bring more people to your project and more people get awareness of that. Um, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right, that was, uh, oh, sorry, there we go. <laughs> Stomping all over my guests again. I should stop doing that. That was uh, Mike Meyer and uh, Jeffrey Hauscher. Oh, go ahead now. Now I've forgotten already. It's the end of the show. Uh, talking to us about Deviation TX. What do you think, Guillermo? <laughs> uh, it, the project sounds super interesting. You know, I'm, I'm, I am actually tempted to uh, download the uh, source code and, and check it out. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 again. It's one of these things. I'm mean, like when we did the open pilot show, and I went, "Oh, it'd be so cool to play with this stuff." And I'm thinking, "Okay, I'm always on the road. Where would it be? It would be in Portland, where I'm never at. <laughs> and then I would just sit in a corner, consuming more space than I need to be taken up. But you know, the, if you've got smarter controllers, I mean, part of the problem was why I was playing back in the dumb days when when you know, like a, fly a helicopter. You really had to be someone who could really fly a helicopter because so many things are correlated. And you have to correlate them all correctly, but. This sounds good. This sounds really, really good. And I'm glad these guys are putting this kind of uh, work in being able to uh, customize stuff. Uh, great. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and look at who's coming up, going to the big spreadsheet there. Uh, coming up next week, we have Copay. That's a follow-up to the BitCore show that we did a while back. And it's about a secure shared wallet where two people have to sign off or three people or any two of four people have to sign off for them to get uh, to make payments from a particular uh, set of monies there. Uh, Lucy is an open implementation of CFML. People are still using that these days, apparently. Uh, just like people are still using Perl. It's not a dead language. It's really not a dead language. Uh, Weave, which is about Docker container deployments, talking about setting up a whole set of Docker things, all talking to each other with a virtual private network between them, so it's all transparent, no matter what cloud you're in, particularly. Veracrypt, which is the heir apparent of TrueCrypt. So TrueCrypt development has stopped, but Veracrypt picked up where they left off, fixed a bunch of the things that were broken, and we've got one of the project leaders coming in to talk about that. Satnogs, <laughs> I guess it's not eggnogs, it's Satnogs, <laughs> is satellite ground stations with commodity hardware. If you want to start Skynet, this would be the ground station of choice. Uh, Augur is a decentralized open source prediction market application platform, which sounds to me like it will be a good show for buzzword bingo. We'll have to figure out what, how that actually goes on. Uh, we will be at OSCON. There's some surprise guest scheduled there. I cannot tell you who it is. Uh, the real hint is, I don't know who it is either. We just have to get there. Um, so, <laughs> surprise guest for OSCON. <laughs> and then, uh, rounding up the list for who's already scheduled is Dart, the Dart programming language, Google's new language for being really smart in the browser. That's uh, Lars Back and Casper Lund, the actual Dart lead guys are coming in to talk about that. That should be a really exciting show. On the short list, we have Koha ILS, Information Management System for uh, uh, libraries, Tulip, which is Application Lifecycle Management, and AngularJS, also on the short list. I should be talking to them real soon now. If you want to see all those names again, because they rattled them off too fast, you go to the big spreadsheet linked from twit.tv slash floss. Uh, if you have a particular project that's not on that list, be sure to um, be sure to have them, uh, say I lost my train of thought, be sure to have the project leader email me. Don't tell me about a project. I know about lots of projects, but I really, it might, works much easier. Almost all the shows in the last 300 shows have been crowdsourced by y'all out there. So if you want a show on, a project on this show, have the project leader email me. The email address is right there, Merlin at Stonehenge.com. Um, you can follow us on Floss Weekly on Google+. Plus. I announce new guests there and occasionally point out things of other good stuff. Uh, and uh, I also that's also linked to Floss Weekly, the uh, uh, Twitter handle. What is that? There we go. We have a live chat. We took a couple of questions from the live chat this time. It's on uh, live.twit.tv. Uh, right now, it's at 8.30 a.m. Pacific times, but... Big important announcement, da, da, da. the earliest show on the Twit Network is becoming even earlier. We're moving to 8 o'clock slot starting June 10th. So we'll be moved back by then. Is it June 10th? June 9th. June 9th. One of those. June 9th. I have 10th written down for a reason. It's really the 9th. Okay. Sorry about that. Thanks for the chat room. 
Um, you can follow me, Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter. Uh, Google Plus is Randall L. Schwartz. Uh, I have a very important announcement I want to make right now. Uh, you all heard about Nepal and the earthquake and the problems there and, uh, you know, the relief efforts trying to go on. My friend Chris Marquardt is an excellent photographer. He's been in Nepal many times taking people up to the base camp at, uh, at Mount Everest. And he, in response to the Nepal uh, situation, has created this wonderful 80-page picture book. Uh, it's just a download, so it's all yours. Uh, you can contribute anywhere between 10 and a hundred dollars and that goes directly to Chris's friends in Nepal or to organizations that he can trust based on what he hears from his friends there in Nepal so you really really uh, really should consider giving that way 100% of the proceeds he, this, he's not making a dime off this it's all going directly to uh, Nepal relief so uh, check that out that's a tfttf.com slash fundraiser tfttf.com slash fundraiser chris thank you for doing that uh i'm going to be also at uh, yapsi north america in early june that means i'll be in the salt lake city area if you're in the salt lake city area watch up for my tweets and stuff like that maybe we'll do a meetup while we get there i'm also going to be down in porto alegre brazil in july uh that's for the fizzle show Five thousand people attending an open source conference huge stuff and i'm going to be presenting it for an hour about dart the dart programming language so i'm learning dart very rapidly so I can teach it. That's the best way to learn something. I think that's enough talking for me. Uh, Guillermo, what do you have to plug today? Uh, I guess not really much. Uh, <laughs> if you, <laughs> I guess you can follow me on Twitter, which is uh, at Gamaral, and uh, look for me on YouTube, which I, I'm posting a few videos there. At, or also just wandering around the streets of Tijuana occasionally. Uh, yeah, that's, it, it depends on the, the uh, time of day and if it's the weekend or not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Guillermo. Hey, your questions were so on spot. I'm glad uh, on spot, spot on. Uh, now my English, now my English is getting bad. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's super hot here today, so I'm not, you know, I'm just a little bit off my game. But yeah, you know, I, I really find most of this stuff super interesting. Uh, I, yep. I get to work on embedded a lot, so it's most it's basically what, what I work on. So it's super great. Yep. Well, you've wasted another perfectly good hour listening to Floss Weekly. No, just kidding. <laughs> so thank, thank you all again for listening to the show, and we'll see you again next week on Floss Weekly. Mm -hmm.